just a second. Sorry about the PowerPoint, but I have a lot of stuff I wanna share with you today. So I think this is the best way to do it. And if any of you would like, sorry, I'm, would like my PowerPoint, uh, who should I send it to, Ron? Or? Uh, we can, you know, share with the, um, we, we can share the PowerPoint presentation with the people after the conference. Okay, so all right. Yeah. Well, I'll send it to you. you all. Can send okay. it to me. Sorry, yeah. I'm trying to get my thing on slide share, but this little Zoom thingy is in my way. Hang on. All right, so I'm going to be okay. We're going to just do this till it disappears. My subject today is something near and dear to my heart, and that's language assessment. So I thought it would be nice to put together something fairly basic with about with what I consider to be best practice in exam development. So that's what I'm gonna be speaking to you on today. Now I realize I only have 45 minutes and by listening to the last session, I see you all have lots of questions. So I might try to skip through a number of these slides and let you, uh, if you want to see them more closely, you can just email me. My, my email will be on the last slide or you can request from the organizers my PowerPoint. So let's get started. What do I consider to be best practice and why is this topic important? Well, I think that these days there's an increased need for teachers to understand the basic tenets of language testing and assessment. This is what is known in the field as assessment literacy. And even as far back as the mid nineties, Stiggin said, he's, he's a general tester, he said that Teachers who have high levels of assessment literacy, they know a number of things. And I think these things still hold true today. They know what they're assessing, why they're assessing it. They know how to assess, what the possible problems with any type of assessment might be. They know how to prevent these problems from occurring beforehand. And they know what the possible negative consequences of poor, unsound, or inaccurate assessment are. Now, I think the rationale for me is that teachers potentially spend as much as half of their teaching time on either assessment or assessment related activities. So I think that statistic is rationale enough for the inclusion of training or professional development for teachers on this topic. So where do we begin? Well, I think we're gonna look at this with a series of questions that we should ask ourselves, okay? Before we actually start designing a test, we need to know, first of all, what type of test will be administered. So we need to know about test types, the difference between a, an achievement test, a proficiency test, a placement, a diagnostic, a criterion referenced or norm reference test, et cetera. So we need to know our test type and we need to know who's gonna be responsible for the various aspects of the development of the test. What information do we need about student achievement is another important question to ask. What are the learning or curricular outcomes? Because good tests reflect back on the curriculum and which also under this are considered the objectives, the syllabus, whatever you want to call it. Another thing we need to think about is um, what are we going to test and are there any test specifications from which to work? A test specification, it's kind of like a blueprint of the test uh, that, that helps teachers or groups of people design multiple versions of a test. We need to know uh, what types of exams or tasks will be included in the test and we need to know what mode of testing will be used. Will it be a paper pencil test? Will it be a computer-based test, a computer adaptive? Is it gonna be something new like a take-home test, et cetera? So how long the test will be in terms of the amount of time we give students and the number of items we need to figure out beforehand and how much waiting will the test have? So where do we get our exam content? Well, the easy answer is we get this from our curriculum because our curriculum should inform our learning objectives and our course outcomes. And it also has information on the levels that our students need to reach, the text types that are utilized within the course materials, the grammatical structures, the vocabulary level attainment, all of this information should be in our curriculum which is then shared in our syllabus 
and hopefully in our test specifications. We can also look to our course materials to find that information because um, we, you may or may not have experience in course development, but certainly our curriculum developers, part one of the most important things they do once they develop the curriculum is they choose the material, hopefully with your input on what kinds of things need to be there. So of course our textbooks, our materials should support the curriculum. It should provide models of the types of tasks that we wanna see on the test. It should provide models of the question types because we should never uh, give a students a test with new types of question types. I'll talk about that later when I talk about reliability. It's important we don't include new types of, of task types or text types. Content should be similar to what's in the textbook in terms of themes and in terms of length for the most part, but it shouldn't come directly from the textbook. I know that one of the, the areas that was confusing for me when I first came to the Gulf many years ago was that students often expected, you know, their reading test to be the text that we had been using in class to practice reading. And this, I'm not sure whether this went on in the high schools, but most certainly, um, most certainly it was something that students expected. Now, another question, which I think is critical, not just for language testing or English language testing us. Another thing that is critical is what kinds of guiding principles we need to keep in mind uh, before we actually get into the test development process. So on this slide, you will see what are known as the cornerstones of good testing practice. Now, not sure who I have in the audience, but if we were in a, in a session together, I might ask everybody with a show of hands, you know, how many of, how many of these guiding principles are you already familiar with? And a lot of, a lot of Teachers are shy to raise their hands and being familiar, but I'm gonna talk about each of these briefly because I think this, if you go away with any content at all from this session with me, I hope you're gonna remember some of the guiding principles because not only are they critical for language testing, but they're important for all types of testing, okay? So the guiding principles are validity, reliability, practicality, washback, authenticity, transparency and security. Let's have a look at each in more depth, okay? Validity is often said to be the most important guiding principle or cornerstone of any kind of assessment. And it's pretty much, does the assessment instrument measure what it is supposed to measure, all right? So appropriateness of the test or the measurement for a particular purpose is inherent in the idea of validity. Now, for, there are lots of types of validity out there, but the, the three that I think are the most critical for language testers, especially classroom teachers, are content, construct, and face validity, okay? We're gonna talk more about those. However, I'd like to share with you uh, a, a resource that you might be interested in. In 2018, I edited a glossary for the British Council entitled an A to Z of Second Language Assessment, How Language Teachers Understand Assessment con Concepts. This, if you email me, I'll send you a copy of this as well as the PowerPoint and I'll send this to the organizers. But it is freely available on the, um, on the British Council website under the How Assessment Works, the How Loft. Uh, portion of that website. So this was an interesting project and 200 and some teachers from around the world submitted uh, definitions of assessment terms. And the key here were, would be that they should be written in such a way where teachers could understand them without having lots of background in assessment. So let's focus more closely on these three types of validity. For me, and many testers disagree with me. For me, content validity is the most important type for teachers because this is the area where teachers often mess up, if you will. Content validity is a two-part thing. It's assessing what and how you teach. So of course, you wanna assess only the content that you teach in your classes or assign as homework. So this, it has a clear reference to the goals and the, out, the outcomes of the course. That's the what you teach. 
And how you teach is important as well. So you want to use formats or test tasks or item types that are already familiar to the students. Now, does this mean you can't use, like, let's say you're going to learn about a new item type in a conference like this one today. Does that mean you can't use new things on your tests? Not at all. But what you first must do is you must practice these new things in a low stakes classroom environment so that students know what to do with them. And once they know what to do with them, then feel free to introduce them into the testing context. Because the danger is if you introduce something new and students don't do well on that section of the test, you don't know whether A, they didn't understand the course content that was being assessed, or B, they couldn't figure out the format that you were asking students to use. So you have to be careful there. So using formats and tasks that are familiar to students will help increase the second cornerstone I'm gonna talk about, which is reliability. So that's content validity. So oftentimes, um, maybe some of you, maybe some of you have students who come to you, or maybe your children come to you, and they say things like, "That test was unfair because the teacher never taught that in class." If someone says that and it's true, this is a major testing violation. So we have to make sure that any item on our test can be tracked back to when we taught it in the classroom or assigned it as homework for our students. The second type of validity important for classroom teachers is construct validity. And construct validity is defined as being the fit between the underlying methodology you use and the way you test. So some of the common methodologies from the past include grammar translation or audio lingual method. Now, hopefully we don't use those kinds of methodologies in our classrooms. Most teachers I speak with use an eclectic approach of what works, but it is predominantly based on communicative language teaching, whereby our goal as teachers is to teach through authentic language, as well as provide our students with authentic tasks to do that they would actually one day do in real life with a language. So, so let's say if you're a person that espouses communicative language teaching, that means that your assessment methods should also reflect on your underlying teaching methodology. So teaching communicatively, but then using grammar translation on your tests is a violation of construct validity. The third type of validity for us as teachers is the concept of face validity. And this is where the test credibility is often judged by not only um, stakeholders in the process, but also uh, by students ourselves. And many times, at least in my own career as a test developer, many times it has been students who have pointed out, let's say a typo or an error. So anytime you see something that is like a typo, a mistake, a formatting error that could affect the student's score, this is a violation of face validity. So there you have it. Uh, cornerstone number one, which is validity. Let's move on to the what I consider to be the second most important cornerstone, and that's the idea of reliability. Reliability is synonymous with the word consistency. So this is the idea where if we give the same test at different times to the produce case, then the test is seems to be reliable. Another aspect of reliability is through the marking, especially through the marking of subjective sections on the test, where there, sub, where there is human uh, involvement in the marking. So oftentimes, this is why we do, um, if we grade essays or longest short answer questions where students actually have to write and produce language, oftentimes, if we have lots of students being assessed, we have um, calibration sessions where we practice marking a few benchmark scripts to see that we can all arrive at the same level when we use the rubric. Now, there are a number of things that affect a test reliability. Let's talk a little bit about those. Within the, te the test itself, the way we construct items can have an effect. If we have time today, I'm gonna go through some of the potential item violations 
that you need to know not to make and also you need to be able to spot in the tests that others develop. So item construction is one factor. The formats you use, I already talked about not using new formats. That can also re uh, reflect on your reliability. The length of the test as well. So oftentimes we have, when teachers develop tests, they have no real formula, if you will, for determining how long a test should take. They often say, well, the test is designed to be taken in an hour because that's the length of my class. Well, when in effect, you, there, are, there are like a rule of thumb that you can follow. And, and basically it is when you develop a test, you give it to a teacher who has not been involved in the test development. That teacher takes the exam, they time themselves as if they were students, then you give, if it takes the teacher 15 minutes to go through the test, then you give anywhere between three and four times that amount of time for your students. Remember, you wanna build in a few minutes for, uh, for students to check their answers as well. So it's important to have some kind of formula in place for determining test length. We all know what happens when we don't have such a formula and at the end of the test, students don't want to relinquish their test papers because they're only like three quarters of, of the way done and that can be tense for all involved. The opposite end of the spectrum is when we're, we're 15 minutes into a 45 minute test, 15 minutes, students are all finished. So obviously they didn't have enough test to do or they've been given too much time. So those are some test factors. We also have administrative factors as well. The setting of the test can be um, problematic. At my institution, we have nice, well-lit classrooms that where we have enough space where our students are not crowded in. So we have really good, um, really good facilities here. But sometimes when we have really big, large numbers of students in the big courses, we often use our big room that holds, I don't know, maybe, I think maybe 200, 250 students. And then the remainder of the students get in smaller classrooms. So sometimes I suspect, although I don't know of any research that would bear this out, I suspect that it is more nerve wracking or scary to take a test in a large room than it is in a smaller classroom type setting. So these are some things we need to think about with regard to the setting. Procedures as well can affect reliability. That's why when our students take any kind of standard ex standardized exam like TOEFL, IELTS, APTIS, any of the British Council or Cambridge exams, that's why we have a script to read if we're the invigilator because we want everybody in the world who's taking that test at that time we want them to get the same instructions. We don't want some invigilators giving more information to their test takers than others and perhaps advantaging them or disadvantaging them in the testing situation. As far as timing of the day, we have to be careful. Uh, they say that the worst time to take a test or to assign a test, especially I think in the Arab world where I think many of us are from, is right after the lunch, where what happens when we've had a big lunch? We kind of feel that we need, we, we get sleepy, we're not at our best. They say also eight o'clock is not such a good time in the morning. So the, the optimum times are of course, mid morning to right before lunch. And as we approach Ramadan, I'm, not, I'm sure there has to have been some research on that. So I feel that Ramadan could also have an effect on scores, hopefully a positive effect and not a negative one. So scoring factors as well have to be taken into consideration. When we uh, develop an exam at the same time, simultaneously, we should develop a marking key so that when the students have finished, if we're doing you know, hand marking, we need to be able to start immediately oftentimes to be able to meet deadlines given to us by our institution. We also have to think about intra and inter rater reliability. This has to do with markers. So if we've got a big team of markers grading the essay, we should get together, grade a few essays together so we know what is, you know, what is an A, what is a B, 
what is a borderline pass, what is a borderline fail, and what is a clear fail. We need to agree on those things. So basically, if there are 25 of us marking all these essays, inter-rater reliability means that there is standardization amongst inter between all raters. Intra-rater reliability refers to our internal standard. This is the kind of, like when I do marking of different things, I oftentimes try to do one whole class at one time. But this is, as, as numbers increase in our classes, this is getting harder and harder to do. So for me, marking time is we have a half day of work on Friday, so that's my marking time. And that goes into the weekend when I have large amounts of time and I'm in a focused environment. But if you're one of those teachers who grades a few during your lunch break and then goes back at night and grades a few more and you grade at different times throughout the day or throughout the week, you have to be very careful that you're grading to the same standard every time you, know, you pick up the pen to mark your students' papers. Affective factor is um, basically candidates' test-taking strategies and their familiarity with different kinds of aspects of a test. So we wanna make sure that oftentimes, and oftentimes it's the English teacher's role to help students develop these test-taking strategies. So of course we want our students to be, um, to have good test-taking strategies and not strategies that help them beat the test. So we want them to be synonymous with good learning strategies. One good thing, that I always tell teachers is the first question on any given assessment should be an easy question. Because if you know about the 30, 40, 30 rule, the 30, 40, 30 rule means that for a classroom test, 30% of your questions should be easy or relatively easy. So that the, the, the possibly underachievers in your class can have access to those questions. The 40% should be mid-range in difficulty so that most students are able to answer those questions. The remaining 30% should be challenging to challenge the, you know, the overachievers or the, the higher end of the scale. So by including as the first question on any test from that 30% of easy questions, that serves as a way to decrease students' anxiety, that test anxiety they feel. They look at their paper, they write their name, they look at the question, oh, it's easy, students' anxiety decreases, they immediately relax, and hopefully they're gonna be able to show what they know. On the other end of the scale, if one of those, if the first question is one of those ones that's from the challenging 30%, students' anxiety will of course increase. Practicality is my next cornerstone of testing. And this has to do with the teacher friendliness of an assessment. And this mainly refers to how much time and resources you have available to you. One of the things that I've often had issues with is the assessment cycle, okay? So oftentimes from a teaching perspective, and when I've directed, okay, let's, let's start writing our midterm exam in week one, Oftentimes teachers say, oh, it's only week one, let's wait a little bit. But in fact, an assessment cycle starts well before the exam is administered. And oftentimes the, the most difficult problems we have with assessment is because sometimes teachers engage in it in a last minute throwing something together and not having enough time to catch the mistakes that are there. So you wanna make sure you have adequate time to, to prepare to grade and analyze the, uh, the assessment. And feedback is an important component. So you wanna make sure that there's a feedback loop or cycle um, built into this process. And oftentimes for practicality reasons, it's often the reason that teachers don't want to become involved in the assessment process. They're, they're basically okay with other people doing it. That of course doesn't stop them from complaining about it after it's done, I might add. Our next cornerstone is washback. And washback is the effect that any kind of test or quiz has on teaching and learning. 
Now, unfortunately, most the, the most famous types of washback are negative, wa negative washback. And the typical example of negative washback is teaching to the test. I remember at my institution, our one of our benchmarks used to be the IELTS exam. And, you know, before students would take the IELTS to pass out of, you know, their English requirements, you couldn't really do anything unless it was IELTS practice. And even if you tell students any type of English that we study that is academically oriented is in fact IELTS preparation, they don't really believe you. So there's the pressure on the part of the stakeholders to get you to do, you know, endless IELTS or TOEFL or other type of exam practice. So this is negative washback is particularly um, inherent curriculum. Positive and an assessment helps all involved learn more about students' levels of ability or accomplishment. So of course, we wanna have positive washback. And when we have that feedback loop that is part of the process, oftentimes we're able to challenge, channel that feedback into the process and help all stakeholders. Next up is authenticity. Now, just as in communicative language teaching, our aim is to prepare students to function in the real world, whenever possible, our assessments should mirror those real world situations and contexts, not only in the formats and the texts that we utilize, but also authentic use of the target language. An added advantage of having authentic, using authentic materials and doing authentic tasks is that they have been found empirically to be motivating for our students. Transparency, yet another cornerstone. And this is the idea or the right that students and of course teachers have a right to clear accurate information about how they will be assessed. The kinds of information they need to be aware of is what they have to do to succeed. What is the pass mark? What does it mean to get, what do they need to do to get an A or a B or a C or whatever? They also need to know what types of expected content and formats they're going to encounter, how much time they're going to have, what the deadlines are, what each task or test up section will be weighted as, what are the grading criteria, what kind of rubric will be used to grade the speaking or the writing section, and any kind of useful feedback for improvement also needs to be shared. At my institution, we have a number of courses and we have, I think at last count, 16 or 18 campuses. So students from all over the country take the same test. So we have our system course team leaders who actually send all students registered for the course this, this information. So they all are starting from the same level of transparency for our assessments. And it's very, very much appreciated, not only by students, but by teachers as well. Security is an important issue and never more so than the, 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 the post that I've been seeing about AI and assessment and chat GPT, et cetera. So you need to be aware of your institution's policy on assessment security. And of course, what the policies are with regard to cheating, plagiarism, or any other kind of academic dishonesty. Uh, staff, faculty, you also know need to know that there are clear security guidelines for all stages of assessment and you need to be able to follow it. Now, there should be serious consequences for breaches of security on both the student and the faculty end. All too often I hear from people uh, around the world with regard to testing is that yes, we bring up cheating incidents at my institution, which means that we have to file all these reports, blah, 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 but nothing ever happens to the student, no matter what. So it's important to, I feel, to follow procedure and to move forward with these kinds of things, even if they don't end in the way we would like them to end. So security, very important. So let's move now to what kinds of qualities good test developers need to have. Well, I think you need to have a knowledge and an awareness of a lot of things, the curriculum, the objectives, the material being tested. You also need to be aware of what type of instructional model or methodology is being used. You need to understand who your test takers are and what the context of your assessment is. 
plus an added ex an added uh, benefit if you have a test specification teachers when they're developing assessments they need to know how to work from this test specification again a test specification is like a blueprint of an assessment that tells you lots of information what kind of themes are being assessed how many questions what is the word count if it's a reading comprehension um, etc so lots of interesting information and useful if you're developing sections of an assessment. You also need to know how what the appropriate test types or item formats are, how much they are weighted, and whether the assessment is a high or a low stakes assessment. High stakes assessment when you're doing classroom assessment is anything that is worth 30% or more of your student's grade. This is deemed high stake because if a student fails something, that's 30% of their grade and they fail it big time, they are in danger of failing the course depending on their other exams, okay? Are there other sections or assessments? Uh, another skill that is very useful is how to write to item writing conventions. We're gonna go over a few of those. It doesn't look like I'm, I'll have the time to go over them in much depth, but again, if you request the PowerPoint, you can read about them. You also need to know about what are the pitfalls of item writing. Uh, one of the training things I use in longer sessions, of course, is I provide teachers with items that have problematic issues or item violations is what they're called in the literature. Because oftentimes, uh, being, teachers are able to spot the problems with some items, but they're not able to spot the problems with their own. I think lastly, you need to have a thick skin because what often happens with testers is that, you know, maybe you have uh, volunteered to do a test, for example, write a test, and you put in a lot of hard work. You've worked at night, on the weekends, with no pay, with no course release. And what often happens at test time, 99 of your questions were great, but one question had a small issue. So what do you hear? Lots of complaints about that one question that had an issue. No thanks for the other 99 that were perfect or near perfect. So oftentimes teachers, they say to themselves, hmm, I work nights, nobody paid me anything extra. I put my heart and soul into that test and now people are like hating on me. That's the usual thing. Oftentimes, and I'm gonna say this, pardon me, any curriculum developers, most of the time any item problems within a test can often be uh, traced back to a curricular issue. But curricul curriculum people are never kind of on the firing line when tests are given. So the easy person to attack or to complain to are the testers. And oftentimes teachers ask themselves, why am I doing this? And they can't find a good answer to say why they're doing it. So they don't do it the next semester. So we lose a lot of good people simply because oftentimes testing occurs at high stress times in the semester when tempers are high. So my advice, please, you know, go easy on testers because they go through lots of stress uh, during the testing season, which now with continuous assessment is kind of like all through the year because we're always engaged in some kind of assessment. So getting started, what do you do? First of all, you have to decide who's going to develop the test. Is it going to be you alone, which I don't advise? Is it going to be you and a team of colleagues? Yeah, that's getting better. Is it going to be somebody with, is it going to be just a tester if you have one available? Not advised either. Is it going to be a testers or people who have been trained in testing and teachers working together? That's what I would recommend because you need, you need testing knowledge, but you also need knowledge on the ground of what's happening in the classroom, and it is the teachers who are best able to provide that. You need to set a realistic timeline for your test development, and you need to start early, throwing something together a week before the exam in last minute panic mode is not advisable. You need to inventory what you need to assess, and you do that by looking at your curriculum, your syllabus, your course plan, your materials. You, then you need to think, okay, of this material that you've just inventoried, what is most important? Usually, that will be weighted in the curriculum, so you can get your information there. Then you need to decide on weighting, create a plan, 
or work from an established test specification. If you don't have a test specification, but if you have a test that really works or has worked in the past, maybe you need to create a test specification from that test. That's called reverse engineering. So you take the test and write a specification that looks like the test that you know has worked, that is tried and true. Make decisions about what types of items or tasks you wanna include. I recommend multiple measures assessment and multiple measures assessment is the realization that there is no one way of doing something right. You have to have different types of assessment. And that means some traditional tests and quizzes but also some alternative forms of assessment, like projects, like performance-based assessments, presentations, et cetera. So if there's one thing that I would like you to take from this session uh, this morning is the whole idea of multiple measures assessment, which is the realization that there is no one single type of assessment that can give a teacher all they need to know about a student's language proficiency or development, okay? Now, I think I have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to try to maybe go through this. Um, again, I'm not going to go through this, but if you need to know the difference between, an, uh, between objective versus subjective test items, here's a little bit of information on this slide, some advantages and disadvantages. Um, what I wish I had another session for is item violations. And these are, of course, the problematic issues mostly with multiple choice questions. So the most frequently made item violation by teachers is this one, the double key. That's where you have more than one answer in a multiple choice question that is correct. That's the most frequently made error. The second most frequently made error by teachers when they write MCQs is the next one on the list, which is the no key. And this happens for a good reason. It happens for because we write a question and then it goes through several iterations and it gets edited, but we, we edit the stem of the question, but we forget to update the list of response options, the ABCD. So oftentimes we have a, a stem that completely changes, but no updated answer list. All the others here are item violations, which if you request this PowerPoint, you'll be able to see on a couple of slides, okay? I'm going to go through very quickly, so you're going to be having the motivation to ask for this PowerPoint so you can read all about them. So some general tips for you to remember is that the questions, the MCQs this pertains to, should be clearly in the STEM. So a student should read the STEM and they should kind of anticipate what the answer will be before they look at the response options. They should also, of course, be clear, precise, and as simple as possible. And four options are optimal for MCQs, and one must be the unambiguous correct answer. The others function as distractors. The only exception to this is if you're using the best answer format, and that's where all of your response options have some degree of correctness, but one is the best answer. Now, four is pretty much optimal, but word, word in the testing community is that, um, the test developing teams from IELTS, from TOEFL, from the British Council, from Cambridge Assessment are looking into decreasing the number of response options in a question to three. Now, I would advise before you do that as an institution, you wait to see how the testing development teams do that and see how they do that. The reason being is that oftentimes when you if you ever write MCQs, you know it's kind of easy to come up with three response options, but oftentimes we search to find that other fourth one that is a good one. And this is especially true with lower levels of English. It, it gets harder to find that fourth one. So that's something to think about for your future test development. In terms of response options, they should be the same length relatively and the same difficulty level. And you should avoid um, answering where you take selective verbatim, where you have word for word matching from the text into the question. Other things to avoid, all of the above, never, always, anything that's absurd or a giveaway distractor, any kind of items that presuppose you correctly answering a previous item. Because remember, all items need to be independent of one another. 
So I think that is all I really have time for because I, I want to uh, make sure that you get my email and we have time for questions. Hope that's okay. Gives us about 10 minutes for questions. So I'll leave this up for before I stop sharing. So you can get a picture of my email if you'd like to request this PowerPoint or send me an email about something. Do we have any questions or any comments? Uh, yes, I see Jeremy's hand raised. Can you turn on your mic? And Well, so uh, yeah, let, let me help you out with this, okay? Because we, we have lots of questions already. Okay. Oh, we do, okay. So, yeah, lots of questions and comments. Um, so the first question for you, Christine, is no. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, how 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 does assessment work? This question is from Summer. How does assessment work? Yeah, it's you know right. it's a very general question, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, I think it works differently in whatever context you're in. In my own context, assessment is to see if and to what extent students have mastered different course concepts. And we have a great assessment system at my institution that follows pretty much all the best practice that is recommended. We have a multiple measures assessment scheme. We have uh, things where students work together on different types of assessment, but they always have an individual grade. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of different types and very interesting types of assessment at my institution. Yeah. Sure, it's the okay. same for all of you. Yeah. Okay, very good. So uh, another question here from Jeremy. He says, mm -hmm. would, it, would it not be problematic for uh, intra-rater reliability to mark in pages? Or pages, yeah. To markers mark get tired. Oh, yeah. Markers get tired, or perhaps less tolerant as they go through mm -hmm. large numbers of papers. Well, research on marking recommends that you don't do more than twenty papers an hour, and that's twenty papers where the essay is about two hundred and fifty words. So you do twenty, you stop and take a break. Basically, that's what the recommended number is. Okay, another but question. But yes, of you. course, if, of course, if you sit down and grade 60 papers, not only will you go crazy, but you definitely are going to have problems with regard to inter-rater reliability, you know, and your own mental capacity. The fatigue factor is crucial. Yeah. Okay, another question from Yunus uh, from Egypt. He says, those who make exams make the first questions confusing on purpose. How can we change this philosophy? Well, they, they shouldn't be writing exams if they're asked. First of all, when we assess, it's to find out how much our students know about what from what we've taught them and what they've learned, not to find, not to confuse them and find out how much they don't know. I'm seeing a question here from Sarah. What about the tricky questions? Is it possible? Yeah, a couple of those tricky questions should occur in the um should occur in like the 30% of higher level questions. But when you have a test where all the questions are, you know, for, are geared towards those who have upper, uh, the upper intermediate group of students, there'll be mass failures. Similarly, if all your questions are easy, everybody will get an A and that's not good either. So you sh if a person wants to trick students, in my view, sorry if some of you are here, you shouldn't be writing tests. So. Okay, another question uh, from Blue Ocean. Will mm -hmm. that be summative or formative type of assessment? Well, yeah, there should be both. And that's part of the that's part of the multiple measures assessment scheme where you have continuous formative assessment, but you also have uh, no, yeah, you also have summative assessments at the end of a like a semester or an academic year. But yeah, there should be a mixture of both. Okay, another question from Summer. Uh, she says, what's the assessment cycle? The, for me, when I talk about the assessment cycle is from the planning stage all the way through the development of the assessment, the administration of it, the marking, and the analysis, and then the feedback, the washback section. So again, any, any group probably now with continuous assessment, assessment teams, 
there used to be an assessment season, like there was placement testing, then there was the midterm, and then there was the final. And we had a little bit of a break in between. But now with, uh, with continuous assessment, teams of teachers are always in the process of developing something. And that's the nature of the beast, I think, now. Okay. Um, there is another one here. Uh, is there what we call, it's from Noha Hilmi, uh, mm -hmm. the head of the testing unit at Forest University in Alexandria. Um, mm -hmm. Is there what we call a perfect exam or it's normal to have debates around the students' answers when correcting their papers? I, I think, you know, nothing is really perfect. It can always be better. But when we look at a classroom assessment, they say that if the mean is 75%, the midpoint of the 70th percentile, then that that implies that the or in, that the exam has discriminated effectively but i think it's always you can always do better so the people you don't want working on assessments are the ones that have an issue with having their questions changed or their text rewritten a bit and there are people like that who think whatever they produce is perfect and they get insulted even by any kind of change. So the best testers are ones that, that um, and, and I'm not recommending that we should change something for the, for the sake of changing it. The change should also, should also make whatever the content is better. So I, that was the first part of the question. What was the second part of the question? Um, what the second part is about the confusion, the debates over uh, the correction, you know, because some, some teachers think that this answer is correct. Some others would say that, okay, we can, um, you know, consider yeah. it right. You know, I think others. this, I think this debate is healthy, but what we shouldn't have is no debate. We shouldn't have teachers going on their own and accepting this for a certain answer. And then not telling other teachers who are grading the same exam that they've been accepting this. And this is the problem with, with hand with subjectively scored things. So it needs to be a decision that people make together and everybody needs to know, um, you know, that that's the change. That's why, and I know teachers don't like it when they are asked to come to sit in a classroom and mark papers together. They'd rather be, you know, I don't know, at home, you know, in their comfortable chairs, marking their papers. But what often happens is students go to, you know, teachers make their own decisions and they give students credit or take credit away from student answers and other teachers do it differently. What we need is consistency, you know, the whole reliability factor. So I recommend, and teachers hated me for it when I, I was in charge of testing, marking papers in one room so that when something came up and you say, well, I think for question 14, we should accept blah, blah, blah. And then we discuss it and we decide as a group or through the person who's in charge of the test to actually uh, make that change. And we change the key. And nobody likes that because then people groan and they say, oh, we have to go back and give students credit for that answer. I always say, it's my job to ensure that students get credit for what they know. So I'm sorry you have to go back, but that's just the way it will have to be. So that's my take on that situation. I think we have okay. time for one more question. Yeah, one last question is, um, you know, for Mr. Ahmed, he says, what's the difference between electronic assessment and paper one? Are there any distinguished key elements? Well, oh, yes, definitely. We, we could have another session on that. But I think that, you know, now we're all rethinking the whole, like, my institution, we use a lot of online assessment. But now that's being rethought for a number of different reasons. I think if you look at online assessment, one of the big advantages is that you can randomize the questions for every single, you could have the same bank of questions on the test, they can be randomized. And within each multiple choice question, they can be, the, the response options can also be randomized. So the security is often uh, better. And you can have each, each student can have a different test basically. Whereas if you do that in a paper pencil test, it would be 
really problematic to have like 25 different versions of the same test. It would be a lot of added administrative work. And then there's the option of where you, where the computer grades any of the objective se uh, sections. So no human error is infused in those. And pl yeah. plus with an electronic exam, students can still write an essay and teachers have the option of going in and great hand marking that as well. So lots of, that's the topic of a whole different presentation, I think. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that was really good, Christine. Thanks a lot for coming today. We have so wonderful, so many wonderful comments and we really appreciate your um, effort in this presentation. And of course, mm -hmm. guys, let me remind you that Christine uh, will share his presentation with us. Uh, and then we, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna share it with all of you here and the other people who registered to attend our conference. Thanks, good, so good. thanks a lot, Christine. Thanks a lot Thank again. You.